Last week, we had uh, concluded with sort of like the intro of why we, we differentiate from other denominations that we have in Christianity. Uh, and it, it is a big factor uh, why we call ourselves Baptists is because Baptist is a very defining uh, a sacrament uh, that we have uh, that we look toward as a uh, looking back through the scriptures that we believe that we are practicing the proper um, uh, sa- way to uh, administer the sacrament um, and we got into a little bit of the uh, information now going forward where do Baptists themselves see themselves in history we have other people other churches other denominations who will try to say that the Baptists started in the 15 1600s uh, there's two different uh, thoughts on that and it's really the people that were the part of the Catholic Church or part of the reform movement that actually sort of placed those dates on when they start when they started Baptists themselves believe in Baptist perpetuity, which means it started back with John the Baptist and on through. So that's what we've been uh, um, going into right now. And I wanted to go into, uh, first of all, this morning with, uh, we started to pick up on Charles Spurgeon, who was a famous theologian in um, the uh, 1800s in England, and what he had to say about it, and then we're going to look at uh, one of the church early fathers, Tertullian, who uh, also talked about uh, adult believer baptism, although it's different than what the Baptists believe at this point in time. But it is something that at least one of the early church fathers actually acknowledged um, what baptism, uh, what true baptism should be. Um, <clears throat> anyways, going to Spurgeon. Just to give you a little bit of background, I think every is anybody need a handout to, from last week? Uh, you guys okay? Okay. Um, anyways, uh, we see that uh, he lived from 1834 to 1892. Um, you know, a, a really pretty pretty short life when you think about it, and yet when you see his accomplishments, uh, it's a it's very uh, honorable. Um, he was called the Prince of Preachers. Uh, he was he was in England, and uh, it is estimated that he preached the gospel to over a million people. He personally baptized fifteen thousand believers, and he had a church. It was really probably one of the largest mega churches that we would see in the in, uh, as we would see it today, of six thousand members. He reportedly knew them all by name. Now, I don't know, that's, that's hard to believe, but okay, when you see what Spurgeon does, maybe it's not so difficult to believe. But uh, Spurgeon believed that Baptists were the original Christians. Um, <clears throat> he believed that the Baptist adher- adherents were never a part of the Roman Church uh, or the Reformation. History shows that Baptists were persecuted by both the Roman Church and the churches of the Reformation. So he, you know, he, he went down through history and uh, looked at what we'll see a lot of when we get into other sections of uh, who we're going to just study. Uh, we're going to see that most of Baptist history is recorded in legal records. It's not recorded by the church because these were considered outsiders, okay, to the Roman church and to the Reformed churches. Um, so we see them in the uh, basically because they were uh, persecuted and there were legal records as to why people were persecuted and put to death so that's where you see the Baptist movement okay Charles Spurgeon I'll read that second page that we have in our handout Um, some of the quotes that he has believe that we believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We do not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther and Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, or we, or we were never in it. 
but we have an unbroken line up of the apostles themselves. Now, let me just stop there. He refers to Luther and Calvin. I think I made this point before, but I want to stress it again. Luther and Calvin, where did they come from? Catholic the Catholic Church. They were both Catholic priests. So they came, the Reform movement actually came from the Roman Church. So many of their beliefs that they had also spurred them into how their denominations look upon baptism. Um, they had different views than the Roman Church, but at the same time, they were also affected by that because they both believe in infant baptism, which is totally contrary to what we believe. Um, Wait, you're saying that Calvin and Luther both believed in infant baptism? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, it exists right now. You, you go to a Presbyterian church or a Lutheran church, you will see they, they perform infant baptism. Okay, and it's there's two different beliefs as to what they're looking at baptism means in the whole keeping of the sacraments, so to speak. And, and we differ with that, uh, the, those beliefs. But yes, they, they both came from the Catholic Church. They both uh, uh, went uh, from the Catholic Church, but they had their own set of beliefs. Now, the one thing they did believe that we believe is that the God, uh, that the uh, authority of Scripture is above church authority. But in the Catholic and the Orthodox, it's the reverse. The church is the final authority, and Scripture is subordinated to it. So that gave them the right to interpret the Scripture the way they wanted to interpret tradition, and everything else became a part of it. And uh, this is what the Reformers tried to do, was to say, no, our basis for our beliefs are found in Scripture. And they do back it up with scripture, although we disagree with the interpretation of many things that they, they come with. So anyways, I wanted to uh, make that point. Um, even though our history is sort of hidden, but it was there, but these two gentlemen were definitely not a part of it, and they spoke against the Baptists, okay? They were part of the persecution of the Baptists. Um, okay, let me pick up here. Um, persecuted alike by the Romanists and the Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. Let's stop there. Think about that difference. We have, have we ever heard of a history of the Baptist church we were the persecuted. Did we ever persecute anyone for their beliefs? We, had, we in fact, found ways to disassociate ourselves, but not, not through persecution. If you remember um, in your uh, American history, you'll be told about Roger Williams who settled in, Prov uh, in, in Rhode Island, created the state of Rhode Island. Very small state, obviously, but... Um, he settled there. He was actually a part of the Puritan movement, but he stuck to the Baptist principles, and he disassociated himself and moved from Massachusetts into a Rhode Island and set up a Baptist community there because of persecution by the Puritans, who were, in fact, being persecuted by the Church of England. That's why they came to America. So this is... But we have never had that association of persecuting someone who didn't believe the same way. We just wanted to wash up. We believe that, you know, everybody has their own belief, okay, that's fine, but we felt like we had to maybe get away from that persecution, so that's what he did. Okay, so you see that as a part even in America. Um, we have that he says that uh, we have ever been ready to suffer or uh, martyrdom uh, and will prove, uh, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ so to any alliance with the government. And we will never make the church, although the queen, 
the despot over the consciences of men. Okay, so he's talking about the Queen of England, who was Victoria at the time. Um, having, you know, the church and state were tied together. Church of England was tied to the royalty. Um, and we see that there had been a history through the Church of England of uh, a persecution, but now uh, there was sort of a lightening up of that. There was still, you know, they were able to evangelize, they were able to do things, but what he's saying is that we've never been a part of the church, I mean the state, okay? And to some degree I have a problem with what happened in our country because you'll notice the doctrine of church and state was actually a Baptist doctrine. And the state has now used that as a way to keep, try to keep Christianity out of the government, not the way it was supposed to, you know, we were supposed to be able to influence the government, but we didn't want anybody coming in from the government to influence the, the church. And that's really what the wall of separation that Thomas Jefferson talks about, because when Thomas Jefferson wrote the letter, this is based on a letter to this court decision, it had nothing to do with the Constitution, there's no place in the Constitution that says separation of church and state. In fact, it was Congress who was not to make a law that prohibited the free exercise of. And so, to me, free exercise means we, we have a stated conscience that if our politics says, okay, we don't believe in abortion or we don't believe this, that that stands above what the government is trying to say. We, stand, we, we have the ability to influence the government, whereas the government can't, shouldn't be able to come in and tell you what you can preach in your house of worship. Okay, that's the difference of what Thomas Jefferson... Now, why did that occur? Why did that letter occur? It was written to uh, Danbury Baptist ministers who were questioning why Thomas Jefferson was giving money to some local churches for some social activities to have them uh, do. And he said there was a wall of separation so that just as you said, Roger Williams was saying, this wall of separation, the government wasn't coming in. We were just trying to get them some money so they could do something that we would ordinarily do. Okay, but you do it better. But we've now turned that around and said, <laughs> we have no influence in the government. That's what a lot of people try to do. That there's a wall of separation that Christians shouldn't even be involved in the government or their beliefs shouldn't be involved in the government. So they get that distinction. And so that has caused a problem. Um, anyways, I can go into that a lot. There's a lot of history of that and everything else because there used to be uh, church constitutions and everything else that stated you had to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and you couldn't be an you couldn't be an officer. You could wash it the way you wanted to, but you couldn't be an officer. And we we really did have in the founding of this country. All those things have been thrown out of every state constitution, but at, least at one time it was there. So it's, it's interesting how, what that has progressed into. Um, okay. Uh, history has hitherto been written by our enemies, we, who, who never would have kept a single fact about us upon the record if they could have helped it. Yet it leaks out every now and then that certain poor people called Anabaptists were brought up for condemnation. From the days of Henry II to those of Elizabeth, um, we hear of certain unhappy heretics who were hated of all men. For the, for the true sake which was in them, we uh, re read of poor men and women with their garments cut short, turned out into the uh, fields uh, to perish in the cold, and others who were burnt at Newington for the crime of Anabaptism. Long before your Protestants were known of, these horrible Anabaptists, as they were unjustly called, were pro protesting for the one Lord, one Protestant, I mean, one faith, one baptism. Um, no sooner did the visible church begin to depart from the gospel than these men arose to keep fast all the good old way. The priests and monks wished for peace and slumber, but there were, was always a Baptist or a uh, tickling men's ears with Holy Scripture. 
and calling their attention to the errors of the times. They were a poor persecuted tribe. The Halter was thought to be too good for them and at times ill-written history would have us think that they died out. So well had the uh, wolf done his work on the sheep. Yet here we are, blessed and multiplied, and Newington sees other scenes from Sabbath to Sabbath. Okay, Newington is a in England, and now it's changed. And what he's saying is they persevered throughout history. But you'll see record of these Anabaptist. Anabaptist means for baptism or for immersion. Okay, that's really what the term uh, means. And uh, I can attest to this. If you look at the Westminster Catechism, the um, I'm trying to remember what the Christian Reform uh, it's out of the Dutch, but anyways, their catechisms talk about baptism and how they don't believe what the Anabaptists believe. So that already gives you an indication, at least at the Reformation, that we already had existing sects out there that were for baptism by immersion. Okay, so, and right in their catechisms, they talk about the differences and they, you know, this is why we believe, and they'll, get, they'll cite scripture for it, um, and what we believe, and we cite ours, and we also go back to the Greek as to what baptism actually means, what the word means. So we see that <clears throat> there has been a, a, a historical record, even though it, the Church of Rome especially would have been someone who was trying to stifle that through either uh, <clears throat> death, uh, persecution. Uh, we have a uh, uh, look at what took place in, in, in the Inquisition period during the um, from 1400 to 1600, what they were trying to do, anyone who didn't, who wasn't Catholic, even to the point that this, uh, Spain tried to, with its famous armada, tried to conquer uh, England, and part of that was due to religious differences. Okay, uh, it was part of you know who's going to control the sea, but it also was because of religious differences because the uh, king of Spain at the time was very much thinking he was a warrior for the Catholic Church. Okay, so we're going to put these people to death and we're going to you know, either convert or die type of thing. So that, that situation was going on. As we know, the English won and basically Spain became an afterthought after that, <coughs> after that defeat um, and pretty much has been relegated to the back heap of history too. I mean, England at that point in time, after that battle, and then after its its uh, thing became, you know, really when you look at it from the 17th to the 19th century, um, England ruled the world, you know, colonial, uh, colonialism, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> we have that. Uh, you know, I think the Lord works in in ways in which to keep his church, his true church going through. And I think, uh, you know, he, he's put them on the back heap of his, history. I, and I pr truly believe, and I'll state this as an opinion, what's coming out now about the Catholic Church is another idea that, you know, I think, you know, their belief system and everything else is rot, their, their whole situation. Uh, they. Quite honestly, they, they're just, uh, people don't, I don't think many people really take them seriously anymore because of, uh, of the sexual misconduct and everything else. I mean, how can you, how can you? So, okay, so we, we have uh, Spurgeon's uh, opinion on things, but he has a, a, a lot of, I think, truth and fact to back it up. We will be going into a study also the um, what what we will call uh, J. M. Carroll, who was also a contemporary of, uh, although a late contemporary of uh, Spurgeon, did a lot of research, and his research really came down to documenting, and we'll get into some of the document uh, documentation he did uh, in his book written, The Trail of Blood. Okay, so we're we'll get into that as another feature of looking at uh, Baptist history. Um, 
we're going to go back. We're going to go now to uh, Tertullian, who was an early church father. You have his bio there. Uh, they call him the first Baptist theologian. Okay, um, he's not really. He's Baptist in the sense of he took the word baptism or baptizo in the Greek to certainly mean immersion. And but he's not really and we're going to see the difference here. He's not really tying to the same belief that we have as Baptists today. But we at least have some early church father who is already talking about the error of infant baptism. Um, he's born in 150 AD, which means that he is probably just about a generation off of the death of the apostles. John um, died, the last apostle, around 100 AD. And then you have other uh, people who were associated with the apostles who were younger that were also carrying on. So Tertullian is not necessarily that far away from those uh, from the apostles or the very early leaders we talked about Clement who may we think is mentioned in um, the Bible by Paul uh, as being the uh, taking over you know he was he was in the church at Rome he when Peter was uh, crucified he then took over leadership so he's actually mentioned in the scripture he's one of the early church fathers also we don't have any record of him talking about baptism or anything, probably because there was probably not that much disassociation with it, with what it was originally intended to be. Um, and, but by the time we get to the 150-200 AD area, we already start to have um, our leaders and church leaders that are in different churches already talking about infant baptism. Okay, and, and what it meant. And we can see when we look at uh, Tertullian, okay, we get, a, we get a picture of what they were trying to do in the early church. They were almost like, well, Lord, we'll, we'll fix, we'll, we'll, we'll get more people into the, into the church this way, and we'll fix this problem that we have with persecution and everything else like that by getting more and more believers by families and everything else into the church and we won't have just individual decisions we'll have family decisions being made and it'll carry on through the generations and that's really what infant baptism uh, became in in some sectors okay um, so let me read uh, the first Baptist theologian okay it may be better to delay baptism and especially so in the case of little children why indeed it is is it necessary if it be not the case of necessity that the sponsors too be thrust into danger when they themselves may fall may fail to fulfill their promises by reason of death or when they may be disappointed by the growth of an evil disposition let children come then when they grow up let them become christians when they are able to know Christ, why does the innocent hasten to the remission of sins? Okay, now we already have in that statement something being said as to give you an idea of what the church was doing with baptism. That you actually had to be baptized for the remission of sins. Okay, it wasn't just that you were saved on the inside that you you your repentance and your faith showed that uh spirit holy spirit coming in you now had to actually physically be baptized if you didn't have that baptism there was no remission of sin so get that that's that's a key difference from what you're being taught by the apostles to now what's happening in the church okay so Already he's talking about remission of sins. Now he's not talking about that it's not, that he doesn't believe that baptism is for the remission of sins, which is, he's stating there. But he's saying, well let the children go up, uh, because if you do it now, they may grow up and they may become uh, uh, evil by their disposition and everything else. I mean, they, uh, you know, everybody thinks, oh, okay, they're saved, no problem, but they may 
start again. So in other words, it's like, okay, once they get their own mind, they may just choose not to. So in other words, they, they'll renege on what happened to them in, at birth. Okay, that, that's really what he's talking about. So we see a misconception, I believe, in what they were talking about baptism really meant. Uh, so what they were trying to do is get these okay, kids baptized and say, okay, okay, they're, they're, they're clean. Now they can come to a decision later on, but they've got that baptism, okay? Even though they had no idea. Okay, when you're talking about infants, <laughs> there's no way they can realize what's going on. Okay, so this was why, and if you look at the Catholic Church position and the Orthodox position, it's not only remission of sins, it's, a, uh, it's really a way in which you clean yourself of original sin. Now what's original sin? I'm going to throw that out there. We're all born uh, as descendants of Adam and Eve. Okay. The original sin that was committed cast a curse on all of humanity. That's original sin. You can't get out of that because that's who you are. In other words, it's not like, and that's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin, uh, born of the Holy Spirit, because he could not be, he could be human, but he couldn't be born of a man. Okay, so this is why that was, took, took place. Um, and we see that very clearly uh, in Scripture. We believe in the virgin birth because that was something that um, Jesus was able to live the perfect life and die as a perfect sacrifice. No one else could do that. Um, so that was because he didn't have original sin. And that's what passed on from generation to generation. Uh, and <clears throat> that's why it's easy for a child to do bad, but you have to teach him how to do right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they don't have any trouble doing anything contrary. Um, so that's where the original sin nature comes in. Uh, so the Catholic Church now takes that baptism and says, okay, we need this right away to clean out the original sin. Okay, well, is that really what baptism in, in the scripture is really being talked about here? So I want to close with um, the reading of Acts 16, 25-34. This, this passage can cause a little bit of controversy too. What is it again? Uh, Acts 16, and we're going to start at uh, verse 25 and then through 34. <clears throat> and if you remember this story, this is about Paul and Silas being in the uh, Philippian jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to, to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prisoner, uh, uh, prison doors were, flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas he then brought them out, asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set them a meal before them, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God and he and his whole family. Okay, what do we see as far as the steps here to becoming a Christian? What do we see first? It's subtle here, but the preaching of the word. The word had to be preached. Second, belief, belief in that, what was being preached. Third, baptism after that. 
Okay, we as Baptists take that as we hear the word, we respond to the word because the Holy Spirit is drawing us near. We, our faith is in uh, what the word of God has stated about belief in, in Jesus. Uh, as the only Son of God, who you know, we we talk about believing in His death, burial, resurrection. Um, <clears throat> we also have then after that, then going into uh, uh, be baptized. Okay, so we see that as the thir third sign. So now we see a progression, and that progression is what we believe is how it should be done. Uh, we have our other denominations who will take this scripture and look at that and really focus in on the family. Okay, meaning that, well, there were young kids there. We don't know that, but there, and they became Christians. Okay, they were baptized. Okay, so we have, we have some disagreement on, on that, but what we believe is that this was, in fact, an immer a baptism by immersion, and the steps that followed, and it was an outward sign of something that had already taken place. Okay, it wasn't for original sin, it wasn't for, you know, we have those steps all, all there in that scripture. Uh, but we, we see what happens with some of these other beliefs, and then when you start to add to the fact that, well, this is the scripture, but the church is the final authority, we say what goes on, all of a sudden you get these interpretations to mean different things. So I'll just leave you with that. That's uh, where we're in today, but that to me is why we tie ours right back to what the scripture is saying and not necessarily to church authority or church tradition.